Hello, welcome to another PCR webinar. In this uh, specific one, we will discuss uh, trade-off decisions for patients at, at high bleeding risk. My name is uh, Davide Capodanno. I'm an interventional cardiologist uh, working uh, in Italy. And uh, I will start by showing you what uh, we have uh, prepared for you for the next hour or so. And these are the learning objectives. So essentially, you are here uh, watching this webinar because you want to keep pace with the new standards for uh, defining patients at high bleeding risk. Because you want to be challenged with real cases requiring complex decision making, and believe me, you will see them. And uh, finally, because you want to get insights on how to weigh the risk of bleeding and thrombosis using a new trade-off model and a web application. In order to uh, achieve these aims, uh, we have prepared this agenda for you. Uh, so after this uh, short intro, I will uh, introduce uh, the faculty and the first speaker will be Rosin Colleran from Ireland, uh, showing you uh, what's uh, hot with definitions of uh, HPR. Then we will have uh, Asfar Zaman from UK presenting uh, the first case. We will discuss this first case extensively. And then we will have uh, Chris Naber from Germany uh, with a second uh, challenging cases uh, and again some discussion. We will uh, make some final considerations on uh, the trade-off between ischemia and bleeding and I will introduce a new system in order to uh, inform our decision making in uh, daily uh, life. So if uh, we can uh, have our faculty displayed here, hello everyone, hello Roisin, hello Chris, hello Asfar, happy to see you all uh, in uh, this format. Uh, if you agree, I would start immediately with the presentation by Rosin, and then we can have uh, some discussion and then enter the real life cases. Rosin, please. Great, thanks, uh, Davide. Delighted to be a part of this webinar. So I'm going to discuss, as you mentioned, definition the definition of high bleeding risk. So historically, patients at high bleeding risk have been excluded from pivotal trials of devices or drugs in patients undergoing PCI because of concerns about bleeding on dual antiplatelet therapy. A welcome development in the last number of years is the conduct of a number of trials focusing specifically on high bleeding risk patients. And this started with the Leaders Free trial published in 2015, which essentially took the exclusion criteria from pivotal trials and made them into inclusion criteria, um, as we see here on, on the left. And really since this time, there have been a number of trials completed and uh, ongoing in this population. However, we do see if we look at these inclusion criteria on this slide that these the inclusion criteria used in these HBR trials have differed across all trials with the exception of Onyx 1, which did use the same criteria as leaders free. And this has really resulted in the inclusion of heterogeneous patient populations in these trials with the result in um, heterogeneous um, bleeding rates uh, at one year uh, in these patients. We see here in uh, the senior trial, the rate of, of bark, ble bark three to five bleeding at one year was 3.5 versus almost double the, or more than double the 7.2% in leaders free at one year. Um, so with this in mind, the mission of the Academic Research Consortium for High Bleeding Risk was to develop standardized inclusion criteria for use in trials investigating high bleeding risk patients undergoing PCI in order to facilitate poolability, comparability and interpretability of the data generated from such trials. So um, by uh, literature review and expert consensus, um, ARC HBR was defined by the group uh, arbitrarily as a BARC three or five bleeding rate of at least 4% at one year or an intracranial hemorrhage rate of at least 1% at one year after PCI. So a number of risk factors for bleeding were categorized as either major or minor criteria, depending on the associated bleeding risk. A major criterion was defined as any risk factor which in isolation met the criteria for the definition. So this sparked three or five bleeding rate of at least 4% or the intracranial hemorrhage rate of at least 1% in one year. And minor criteria were any criteria that in isolation were associated with increased bleeding risk but didn't meet this cutoff. So in order to achieve RKHBR status, a patient must meet at least one major criterion or at least two minor criteria. So to briefly go through the criteria, I'm going to show major criteria here in dark blue and minor criteria in light blue. 
So age of at least 75 years um, was defined as a minor criterion. And this is because really the risk of bleeding, increased risk of bleeding with age seems to be more secondary to the accumulation of bleeding risk factors that happens with age rather than um, as a factor of increased age alone. Renal disease was defined as either a major or minor criterion depending on the level of renal impairment. And cirrhosis with portal hypertension was defined as a major criterion, as was active cancer. Again, anemia, depending on the severity, was either a major or minor criterion, and the minor or the major criterion, minor criterion, excuse me, differed according to gender, um, which was according to the WH definition of anemia. And important to note that in all bleeding risk scores, um, anemia is one of the strongest predictors of bleeding. So it really is a, a very important risk factor. Thrombocytopenia with a cutoff of less than 100 platelets um, was defined as a major criterion. Stroke in the last uh, moderate or severe ischemic stroke in the last six months or prior spontaneous intracranial hemorrhage was defined as a major criterion, whereas any other prior ischemic stroke was denoted as a minor criterion. Bleeding diathesis were considered major criteria. Prior bleeding or transfusion were either defined as major or minor, depending on timing, with the cutoff of six months for the major criteria. Oral anticoagulation was defined as a major criterion, whereas chronic NSAID or steroid use was defined as a minor criterion. And then finally, non-deferrable surgery on dual antiplatelet therapy or major trauma or surgery in the 30 days prior to PCI were both defined as major criteria. So a number of validation studies have been done looking at the ARC-HBR uh, criteria. And all of these, not surprisingly, have shown a stepwise increase in bleeding with accumulating HBR criteria. If we look at the study on the left, which was a study from the Burn PCI registry, and, and these were all studies on, in PCI registries from, um, from different continents. But the, the study from the Burn PCI registry shows patients with high bleeding risk in pink and patients who met criteria for high bleeding risk did um, have uh, did meet this cutoff of a bark three to five bleeding rate of over four percent at one year. With patients who didn't meet criteria for HBR having a lower uh, bleeding rate, less than four percent. What was interesting, the, this, the investigators looked at um, thrombotic or ischemic endpoints as well, as defined by the device-oriented clinical endpoint, and this also showed that HBR patients have a have a higher risk of uh, ischemic events at one year compared with non-HBR patients. And again, this increased with accumulating HBR criteria. All right. In fact, when we when we delved a little bit deeper into this data, um, we saw that all studies, all validation studies were associated with approximately a trebling in, um, in the uh, increased rate of major bleeding and um, a doubling in the uh, rate of, increased rate of um, the ischemic endpoint, which deferred across studies. Um, but I think this highlights nicely that patients at, at um, high bleeding risk, uh, it's very important to be cognizant, not just of factors to increase or to decrease bleeding risk, but also to be very cognizant of the trade-off between bleeding and thrombotic or ischemic risk. And with this in mind, um, this is going to be discussed in the following cases. Thank you. Um, since we do not yet have questions from the participants, um, and I would just like to encourage all of them to, to ask the questions here, yeah, I'm continuously uh, monitoring, and if questions come up, I will ask them. But one question that, that really puzzled me, you know, that's about age, because very often we speak about age as a bleeding risk in, in, in my hospital when I speak with my colleagues. Now, you said that it's mostly um, a, a, a sum of all other risk factors. Um, in Leaders Free, um, uh, one of the major inclusion criteria was uh, uh, an age uh, older than 75. And at the end, these patients were at a high bleeding risk. Are there good discriminators to, just, uh, to differentiate which of the old patients are actually going to bleed and which are not going to bleed? Or is it age per se also in them? That's a very good question. And this is one we kind of struggled with when, when we were um, coming up with the criteria. I suppose um, 
certainly discriminators, you know, I, I guess accumulation of any of the other factors in, in the, the definition would, would certainly obviously be associated with increased bleeding risk. Um, I think one, one of the strong reasons why we decided to include it as a minor criterion was if you look at the senior um, trial, and, and I can't go back to my slide, but the, the bleeding rate, the BARC 3 to 5 bleeding rate at one year in the senior trial uh, was 3.5%. Now, the senior trial wasn't a HBR trial per se, and the only inclusion criteria was age of 75 years or greater. Um, but in, in, in these patients who were on, on dual antiplatelet therapy for one, one to six um, months, uh, the, the bleeding rate was significantly lower than, for example, in leaders free, like you mentioned, which was 7.2%. So, um, so I think discriminators would, would really be any of the other risk factors, you know, that, that a lot of which go along with with increasing age, for example, renal impairment, you know, anemia, um, and and of course accumulation of, of medical conditions, you know, such as liver disease or or any of the other uh, conditions in the in the definition. Can I just okay. ask? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Roisin. Uh, so the, the message is clear: age is not enough. You need to have uh, other bleeding risk conditions, probably, to warrant this kind of label, uh, HBR, let's say. But uh, uh, if you agree, uh, we can move now to the case and see this uh, risk stratification system in context, maybe. So I would invite uh, Atsfar to show uh, the first case. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, thanks for the invitation. So Rashin has covered this uh, very elegantly in her talk, so I'm not going to go through this about HBR inclusion criteria and also the major and minor criteria. Suffice it to say that this case that I'm going to uh, describe to you is an elderly patient, which is increasingly what we are seeing in our practice on a daily basis. There is no doubt that the age of the patient uh, is changing and the demographics of the patient in the cath lab now is changed considerably from 10, 15, 20 years ago. So how can we manage uh, uh, any patients, not just uh, elderly or high risk bleeding patients, uh, any patients to try and reduce their uh, bleeding risk? So the first uh, thing, of course, is to use all of these factors that Roisin has presented in her uh, uh, talk, and we recognize and identify upfront the high bleeding risk patients. Wherever possible, we try and control those factors, such as uh, hypertension control, if they're in atrial fibrillation, uh, left atrial appendage um, uh, closures, can, can, can we control the high bleeding risk? Can we take them off oral anticoagulants? And can we monitor their uh, uh, um, change in bleeding risk and ischemic risk over time? Of course, then, uh, as you'll see in this illustration, we can manage their pharmacology, and this is what we're going to talk about. And of course, there are procedural factors. Radial access has been, uh, um, uh, in the rifle study, has been shown to be uh, associated with reduced, not just vascular complications, but reduced uh, uh, bleeding complications from the access site. We can use functional assessment. We can reduce the numbers, size, and length of stent, uh, um, if, if, if at all possible, and of course, if we avoid complex stenting, we can reduce the need for prolonged uh, antiplatelet uh, therapy. If we use uh, intravascular or other imaging guidelines to optimize therapy, also that can uh, uh, mean that we may be able to reduce the length of uh, dual antiplatelet therapy. So this is the history that I wish to uh, discuss today. 90 years old female, and I have to say that the oldest uh, person we have done in our cath lab is uh, 101. So uh, 90 years old female, low body weight of 54 kilograms. So once again, two risk factors uh, there. Permanent atrial fibrillation on oral anticoagulant therapy with dabigatran, 110 milligrams um, uh, uh, BD of therapy, troponin positive, comes in with no minor ST depression, uh, troponins raised, um, and then we manage her medically. And then a day later, she raises her inferior ST segment and uh, goes straight from the ward into the cath lab. I'll show you the picture shortly. Uh, echo shows a gesture fraction of 45% with an inferior regional wall motion abnormality. 
I hope you can see this. So what the red arrows uh, uh, show are thrombus in um, uh, right coronary artery, which had restored to TIMI3 uh, flow by the time we had got her into the cath lab. Because of the amount of thrombus, we didn't predilate. We didn't uh, do thrombectomy, which we've stopped doing uh, uh, since the data has come out. And a direct uh, on extent was delivered over a floppy wire with good angiographic result. So how would we manage this patient after her procedure? So we know that the risks with, uh, for patients who have atrial fibrillation and undergoing PCI are derived from three areas. One is the atrial fibrillation itself, which confers an increased risk of stroke. The second is from the uh, atheroma, um, which can lead to myocardial ischemia. So you have ischemic, stroke risk. And then, of course, from the PCI itself, because of the dual antiplatelet therapy, there is the increased risk of thrombosis and bleeding. So management of patients with atrial fibrillation is a balancing act that the clinician has to weigh bleeding versus ischemia. This lady had uh, uh, several uh, features. So her uh, Chad's VAS score um, actually was five. Um, so a high risk of stroke. Now, we have guidelines from the ESC in 2020 of how to treat and manage these patients with atrial fibrillation undergoing PCI for non-ST elevation uh, uh, ACS. And they categorize it into three strategies. There is the default strategy, there is the high bleeding risk, and there is the high ischemic risk. And if we look um, at the default strategy, so it's triple therapy for up to one week in hospital. Then in the default strategy, it's dual therapy with a direct oral anticoagulant and a single antiplatelet therapy. And importantly, um, this is only for a 12-month period. And after 12 months, and this is where there was some controversy, the recommendation was to stop all antiplatelets and to continue with the direct oral anticoagulant alone. If we just come to this lady who was high bleeding risk, then the recommendation was for triple therapy and then uh, for a week, uh, uh, up to a week in hospital, and then double therapy with single antiplatelet therapy for up to six months and then direct oral anticoagulant um, uh, uh, alone. And so for this lady, what we did was a Chad's Vascor actually was not four, it was five because of her age over 75. We gave clopidogrel for one month that she was on the bigger tran 110 milligrams and we continued that indefinitely. And also we covered, and this is important because this is one of the recommendations also, is that on patients with dual antiplatelet therapy or dual strategy that they're covered with uh, lansoprazole. And we gave this lady lansoprazole for one month. Just to give you the data on which our strategy was based, so there are now four trials, all showing the, the same outcome. So Pioneer, Redual, Augustus, and Entrust a, a, AF. All of them confirm that uh, dual therapy with a direct oral anticoagulant and uh, a single antiplatelet agent reduces bleeding compared to triple therapy. And I think it's now st accepted that dual strategy is uh, uh, the safest in terms of reducing bleeding in these patients. Two weeks after discharge, the lady was admitted to hospital after falling at home and sustaining a head injury. She came in with an extensive periorbital hematoma. Um, she was admitted under the neurosurgeons. We were called and a CT scan showed a subdural hematoma, which you can see in the arrow pointed here, which is a classic image, I am told, with a crescent-shaped overlying uh, uh, filling defect, uh, which was displacing uh, 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 the brain. So our team was called. I was asked to uh, give advice. My advice was that we should immediately, obviously, stop the uh, clopidogrel for at least three days. After three days, the, um, the clot was evacuated uh, by the surgeons, and Cangrelor was started as soon as the surgeons, the neurosurgeons, were happy that they had secured hemostasis. And we continued uh, Cangrelor for 48 hours until uh, we were happy, and then Clopidogrel was restarted. Importantly, of course, and the first time I've used this agent, we now have a reversal agent, Idarucizumab, which reverses the Dabigatran, and that's given as an intravenous uh, uh, infusion or as a bolus injection, and currently in, in the UK is a hospital-only drug. 
Importantly, there is no dose um, adjustment needed for, for this agent, and the amount is based on renal function, age, uh, 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 or weight. You don't need to take that into consideration. There is no dose adjustment required for this drug, uh, a single bolus dose or an infusion. It binds specifically to dibigatran and its metabolites and will not reverse the effects of any other anticoagulant. Um, it does, however, expose people to thrombotic risk, and this is why, on balance, I felt that continuing with Cacangrelor after the surgery was important. And we restarted anticoagulant therapy just on the day of discharge. So the take-home message uh, messages from this uh, presentation is that there are several phenotypic features that determine high bleeding risk. Of course, in this lady, it was uh, uh, she was elderly, well over 75. She had low body weight, 54 kilograms. She was on oral anticoagulant for atrial fibrillation. So she had been uh, identified as high bleeding risk and the DAPT duration uh, had been adjusted. With hindsight, maybe we should have just kept the, uh, single antiplatelet therapy uh, clopidogrel for a week, but she was continued for a month. Aspirin was not given. And the ESC guidelines give various treatment options, various strategies for antithrombotic treatment based on assessment of bleeding and ischemic risk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, I see that there are already a lot of questions in the chat, Chris. But before going to that, uh, let me ask, uh, as far as uh, I have a curiosity, of course, uh, because this was a great case uh, that explained all the challenges that we have, uh, even when we try to do our best. Uh, in the end, uh, this, this was a fall. The patient had this uh, problem. And of course, uh, this is also incorporated in the HPR definition, the probability to fall and have uh, a trauma and an injury. Uh, but in this case, uh, uh, I want to ask uh, your opinion about uh, this uh, potential, uh, I don't know if a discrepancy in the, in the guidelines uh, that you have shown, because uh, in the RKHVR definition, having the oral anticoagulant uh, already uh, qualifies uh, as uh, having an HBR. But uh, you have shown that uh, among these patients uh, uh, with oral anticoagulants, we have those at high bleeding risk and those at high thrombotic risk. So the question is, how can we identify high bleeding risk within the eye bleeding risk? Yeah, so this is a um, difficult question to answer, David, because I guess you're answering this question because we know the patients who are at high bleeding risk are also at high ischemic risk. So the way I would answer this is what is most likely to uh, harm this patient uh, that, that we have in front of us? And I think in a 90 year old low body weight, it is the high bleeding risk element that we are going to do most harm to this lady. So in, in, in somebody like this, I think you have to assess the bleeding risk. In this lady, it is very high. With hindsight, I would have just given clopidogrel for a month. At the time, we didn't have the Resolute Onyx data. Um, well, I would have given it just for a week, sorry, not for a month. Um, I would have given it for a week and then sent her home on oral anticoagulation because she was very high bleeding risk. I agree. This is my assessment as well. Of course, 90 years old, underweight, uh, this is uh, something that prevails. But Chris, maybe we have uh, some questions from uh, our audience. Yeah, we have uh, indeed some questions uh, in the chat. And uh, there's uh, some questions going around um, uh, primary PCI and the acute uh, coronary syndrome setting. So um, uh, Dr. Muhammad Massar asks, um, if in this primary PCI setting, we do not have so much time, um, how do we manage then decision making on high bleeding risk patients uh, in this um, in this condition? So, uh, if I may answer, so I agree you don't have a time. The the key thing here is to perform the primary PCI, make sure the uh, uh, vessel is recanalized. You establish TIMI three flow. You can give. Pre-procedure, we always give a loading dose of either prasugrel or ticagrelor and aspirin. Once the patient is on the ward, pain-free and comfortable, that is the time to make that uh, uh, risk-benefit analysis on bleeding and ischemia. Yeah, and so maybe if I, if I may add uh, what I do always, but it's obvious, uh, look at the AKG. If there is atrial fibrillation, 
of course, uh, go radial, do whatever you want to, because this will be an anticoagulated patient. Yeah, excellent. Um, and the second question also goes around that. Um, it's uh, um, if we have a patient, now it's a very difficult scenario, a patient with an ACS undergoing uh, PCI. And if this patient has coexisting hematological malignancies with a platelet count of less than 10,000, anything you really can do. Okay, maybe Rosin, this is for you because this was a major <laughs> criterion in the HBR yeah. definition, I know. Yeah, I think, you know, certainly, I mean, we defined thrombocytopenia with a, with a platelet level of less than 100 as, um, as major, uh, as a major criterion. And, and really, there's very little data from randomized trials on this because it, it has been an exclusion criteria with a cutoff of 100 in, in most um, randomized trials. Um, so there's very little data. I think a level of, of you know, platelets of, of 10, um, you know, it's 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 uh, you're really getting into the the category where you're very concerned about uh, bleeding risk on certainly on dual antiplatelet therapy, whatever about um, single antiplatelet therapy. I suppose outside of the setting of um, a STEMI, at least you have maybe time to um, to discuss this and assess this and have a hem hematological an opinion from a hematologist uh, in a STEMI setting, it gets a bit more complicated. But there again, you often don't have the platelet level to hand in a STEMI setting. So perhaps it's 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 not going to arrive on or arise until after. But I think um, certainly, you know, you're going to try and keep your DAPT uh, duration to to a minimum uh, and and obviously keep away from uh, the more potent, newer uh, antiplatelet um, therapies. So the, the next question would be um, in patients uh, who, who do not have an ACS, so elective patients, um, do we need to adapt um, the heparin um, therapy? So should we aim at a lower ACT, a slightly lower ACT in these patients? Yeah, so if I may uh, take this one, but I want to hear your opinion as well uh, uh, as far, my uh, guess would be why not? Because we have a range for the ACT and maybe going to the lower range, uh, range makes sense. Probably I would increase the frequency of the ACT control in these patients particularly to make appropriate uh, boluses uh, if needed. But as fun, please. So I'm, I use very little he uh, heparin. I don't measure ACT. So we have the Chow study, which was performed a, a while ago. So in simple type A lesions on dual antiplatelet therapy, these uh, uh, um, trial investigators used no heparin and found no difference in outcomes. I think the role of heparin in, 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 in PCI in the presence of dual antiplatelet therapy has not been uh, uh, tested. If people, and you should give heparin, um, we use heparin saline for our flush. So I, I, I don't check ACT. I'm not weight adjusted. I give between three to 5,000 of heparin as a standard dose, depending on the duration of the therapy, the duration of the procedure rather, rather than the weight of the patient. So if the procedure is going to be quick, it's 3,000. If it's going to be a prolonged procedure over an hour, it's 5,000. Okay, Chris, any other we questions? One final question, yeah, we have one final question, which is maybe a, a little bit in a different scenario, but also interesting for high bleeding risks in general. It's about left atrial appendage occlusion. So maybe not in the scenario of primary PCI or PCI, but in the scenario of these AFib patients. And we and want to hear your opinion as well, uh, Chris. Uh, what uh, would be your... Uh reply to that. Well, I mean, uh, I, I already answered that. I think at the PCI setting, this is, uh, this is uh, not the point, but um, for these high bleeding risk patients, um, if patients bleed, I think this is a very good option, uh, interventional option for patients um, if they have to take anticoagulation. So um, I think it's really meaningful and uh, we, we should look for these patients because sometimes we miss them because they go in the gastroenterology department and we don't see them. Yeah, and what is nice to know is that there is uh, 
quite a few upcoming trials that will compare NOAC versus the left atrial appendage closure, which is the real question now that has to be addressed in a randomized trial. So we will hear yeah. more about this uh, probably in the future. As far maybe you want to add uh, anything on that. Yes, so, so this is a, a really good point. So for this lady, we uh, uh, at the point of discharge, we offered her left atrial appendage closure, but you know she refused. But my practice now is that if I identify high bleeding risk on a on a direct oral anticoagulant and a risk of a fall, which this lady clearly uh, is, she's at greater risk now. And patients such as this should be offered left atrial appendage closure. Okay, so thank you uh, for this uh, illustrative case. Very important. We have seen also the use of an antidote in uh, in this uh, uh, case that ended with an intracranial hemorrhage, unfortunately. But now let's see uh, the second case from uh, Chris. What happened with yours? Yeah, thank you very much, Davide. Um, so the case that I brought uh, for you today is uh, not the case of a major bleeding. It's not even a patient with uh, high bleeding risk. But I think it's a very interesting case. At least I have to say i never seen something like this before. So stay tuned and uh, let me go in the case. So it's a, it was a male patient. As I said, no major bleeding risk. Uh, the patient had, had uh, prostate cancer, had surgery, and it was under chemotherapy. Um, at the end, now he was under radiation therapy. Um, he was treated with uh, aspirin and atorvastatin because of his general risk. He had hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, and he was a smoker many years back. So um, now this patient came to our chest pain unit because he had a kind of on-off chest pain symptomatic over the last uh, two days, getting really worse, and now remaining chest pain for the last two hours. Now... This is uh, the ECG that you see. So it's a clear anterior myocardial ST elevation infarction. We put this patient on the table. And uh, what you see here is the right coronary artery, some mild disease in the proximal right, and uh, some stenosis in the bifurcation, but nothing really severe and rather small vessel. Now, if we look at the left, uh, you can immediately appreciate in the, in the uh, uh, left anterior descending, you see a proximal stenosis. And if I would have brought the video, you could have seen that there's still a little bit of thrombus ongoing. So you can appreciate the on-off symptomatic and uh, the circumflex and uh, the, uh, the marginal branches look okay. So the treatment was not very spectacular. We just uh, dilated. Um, then we uh, put a drug looking stent. We did some pot because there was a smaller diagonal going off there. And I think that was a nice result. We had TME3 flow. Everything was fine. Patient was pain free. The patient had a rather uncomplicated course after the primary PCI. He developed some CK, maybe because uh, the symptoms were um, ongoing for some time already. All uh, uh, parameters were normal, including platelet counts, uh, um, correlation parameters, and so on. Um, ejection fraction was okay. Um, he had a little bit of anterior hypokinesia. And so we discharged him after six days on dual antiplatelet therapy with the Cagrelor and aspirin for 12 months. That was the idea. Um, and I thought the patient is fine. Now, in March, um, 2021, so just last month, I received a call uh, from the rehab physician because it was after his radiotherapy in the cancer rehab. And um, he called me and said, well, you know, this patient, he developed some petechia on his back, which were slightly but constantly bleeding. And mainly they were looking at this because the patient were, was complaining that he couldn't wear a shirt because he always had the blood in his shirt and he was not able to wear any shirt anymore. Um, and the patient was so kind to send me the picture. So you see all these, these small points um, which were bleeding, but not severely. So it's, it's rather minor. Now, the question and, um, that I would have, and I don't know, whoever has an idea what this is can write it in the chat. <laughs> I will mention his name. Uh, actually, I, I never had an idea. Um, I really had to research and I had to look what could this be. Um, so what I found was this. Um, there's a form of thrombotic thrombocytopenic purple 
um, which can happen after ticlopidine, clopidogrel, and prasugrel, and also ticagrelor. There are some three cases, I think, in the literature. And this is a very interesting syndrome. Honestly, I never heard um, of this syndrome after I finished uh, my studies at the university. Um, but uh, I thought this could be a case like this. And TTP, what is that? It's a life-threatening condition caused by microthrombi in the arterioles and capillaries. Um, it has to do with the decreased downbreak of, of von Willebrand factor. Um, TTP has been reported after all tienopyridines. And usually you find neurological symptoms, which we didn't have. Um, fever, you can find a renal uh, impairment, hemolytic ane anemi anemia, um, reduced platelet counts, and then you find something which is uh, pathognomonic. It's uh, the ADAMS13 activity is reduced. ADAMS13 is a metallo uh, uh, proteinase which, uh, which uh, uh, degrades the von Willebrand factor. So this is something which you should do in order to have the diagnosis uh, uh, firm. Now, um, in our patient, we only found a uh, reduced blood count. It was uh, 35,000. Um, all the rest was normal. Um, even blood smears were normal. Uh, kidney function was normal. No fever, no other symptoms. And ADAMS-13, despite we asked for that, was unfortunately not measured. Um, the question is, what do you do in such a patient? Because platelet count was normal in this patient before. And um, the only new drug he was taking was Ticagrelor. Um, so despite the bleeding was okay, the patient was now at risk. Um, so what do you do then with this patient? Um, the, the thing that you have to weigh now is the risk of the patient. And this is what we saw already. This is from the uh, European guidelines on dual antidepressant therapy. I think if you look at this, at this um, uh, chart, it's a little bit confusing at the beginning, but if you go through it, you can see on the left panel, you see uh, clearly this is about stable patients. On the right panel, you see clearly this is about ACS patients. So we have to look at two conditions. The first about the stable patients is on stent thrombosis. And here we see that if the patient is at risk, in particular at a high bleeding risk, then you can reduce uh, the dual antiplatelet therapy to three months or even to one month, which is then only 2B C recommendation, which means that um, the colleagues consider this as an expert opinion to be doable if the patient is, for example, at the high bleeding risk. Otherwise, the three months is 2AB, which means most colleagues consider that and we have some data. Then if you go on the right side, which is uh, for the ACS, then we have recommendation for longer dual antiplatelet therapy. And why is that? And I just want to show you some curves and don't worry, I don't want to go too deep in the details, but this is one of the early uh, trials about uh, 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 dual antiplatelet with clopidogrel clarity. Here we see only 30 days, but we see that these curves are, uh, are, um, uh, are continuing to uh, go uh, to depart from each other. So the distance is getting bigger. And um, we see the same if we look at Triton Timmy uh, 38, which was Prasugrel over Clopidogrel in dual antiplatelet therapy. You see until 450 days um, that the, the uh, curves continue to separate. And we see the same then if we look at the PLATO trial, where it's Ticagrelo of or clopidogrel. And this is why we have these longer recommendations, which basically mean that we have a prospective advantage for these patients, which is smaller than if we look at the early separation in the beginning, um, because this is then stent thrombosis. Um, now, what did we do in our patients? We stopped ticagrelor immediately. I asked the, the rehab physician to stop that. We continued aspirin. Why? Because the patient has had aspirin before, and um, so I thought this will most likely not come from the aspirin. And indeed, the bleeding stopped after five days. Platelet counts slowly returned to normal. They were not normal after four weeks yet. But um, we thought uh, that we could give it a trial because if you look in the literature, uh, very often this TTP is related to one uh, specific drug in a patient. So we started Prasugrel at 10 milligram per day and uh, measured platelet count and so on. And honestly, everything was fine. I just talked to the patient before this seminar. He, he is perfect and the platelet counts are now normal again. So our target will be, because he will profit in the future, dual antiplatelet therapy for 12 months. <laughs>
Um, now, what is our diagnosis? Possibly early TTP after tick of Um, Our considerations was the risk of stent thrombosis versus the prognostic value of dual antiplatelet therapy of STEMI. We had to weigh the risk of recurrent thrombocytopenia, which was specific for the TTP. Um, and a reasonable alternative would have been the cessation of dual antitherapy after three months after primary PCI at all, and this is something we can discuss. Thank you very much, Chris. This is uh, another important case that brings into the discussion another important uh, point, which is a kind of patient preference thing. Because in this case, uh, essentially, the bleeding was uh, minor. Of course, we have uh, listened from uh, Chris what was the reason, but the patient complained because uh, he didn't uh, have a, a good quality of life. Uh, he couldn't uh, put a shirt on, uh, on the shoulders. So I would like to ask Royzin, what is your reaction when a patient has a minor bleeding and wants to stop all the medications? You re reassure the patient, you go case by case, uh, or you say, okay, this will disappear, please continue your uh, medications. I think um, certainly I would go case by case. I mean, it, it, it really depends on the presentation of the, of the patient, how high is their ischemic risk? And I guess this gets back to the, the ischemia, ischemia bleeding trade-off or thrombotic bleeding trade-off, but did they present with an ACS? Was it a complicated procedure? Was there a high thrombotic burden? Did they have, you know, multiple stents or, you know, a long uh, segment of stent, more than 60 millimetres of stent? Was it a bifurcation procedure, et cetera, et cetera? So I guess, you know, if, if the answer is yes to any of those questions, I'm certainly going to push more strongly for, for a longer duration of dual antiplatelet therapy. On the other hand, you know, I suppose, and, and this is something we did discuss in the, the second um, uh, consensus document from, from the uh, RKHBR, we talked about PROMs and, and patient-related outcome measures. Um, and really that, you know, I suppose we didn't include BARC2 bleeding uh, in our primary, our recommended primary endpoint for these trials, but we did say it was important because it certainly does affect quality of life while they're not major bleeds. And, and it certainly is a, is a consideration, you know, particularly if a patient is presented with a stable, uh, with stable or chronic coronary syndrome, uh, as we now call it, um, and it's significantly affecting quality of life and they've gotten over the kind of, you know, I suppose the first month where you're most concerned about thrombotic events. And I guess every month thereafter, we know that the risk of stent thrombosis decreases, uh, whereas the bleeding risk, uh, you know, uh, stays at least as high as it is up, uh, as it was up front. So I think, you know, on a case by case basis, you really weigh up the, the, the bleeding risk and the thrombosis risk versus the thrombosis risk. And I suppose, uh, you know, if the patient is amenable to staying on 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 daft, certainly that's that's great. You know, if, if you can reassure, but but otherwise you have to make that decision based on on that trade off. Okay, so tailored therapy uh, case by case basis, and your point on bark two is very important because sometimes because of a minor bleeding, the patient disrupt all the medications, including aspirin, that would have been dangerous in this case. As far, what is your reaction to the case presented by Chris? Yes, it is, it is rare, uh, thank goodness, but uh, it, we had a, a several cases with uh, when we were using glycoprotein inhibitors where we used to see this quite mm. rapid uh, thrombocytopenia. So we published a paper looking at the uh, prognosis in patients who have a clear drug-related fall in platelets and that recovers once the drug stops, and we compared it to those uh, a published data with idiopathic thrombocytopenic uh, um, uh, um, thrombocytopenia, idiopathic. And it's quite clear that if you have a drug-related thrombocytopenia that recovers on stopping the drug, these patients have a much better prognosis than idiopathic thrombocytopenia. So the one learning uh, uh, point for me from that excellent case of Chris's, although it's rare, the good thing is that when the agent that was thought to cause it, which was tricagrelor, was stopped, the platelet count, if I remember correctly, starts to climb. So I think you can make that uh, uh, assumption that it was the ticagrelor that has caused this idiosyncratic reaction and that in terms of prognosis, this, this patient should, be, should do well. Mm -hmm. The problem arises when you have a patient with uh, uh, idiopathic thrombocytopenia and how to manage these patients is very, very difficult. And I think that's the 
question that Roisin was asked. And, and I think it is here where you have to work very closely with the hematologist because it's not just the platelet numbers, it's the quality of the platelets also. Mm -hmm. And the hematologist will tell you that they can do bleeding tests and, and, and they will come back to you. And, you know, it, it amazes me how many times they've come back to him and said, yeah, platelet of, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, 10, not a problem. You know, because the patient uh, uh, stops bleeding. So I think when you get idiopathic thrombocytopenia, you have to uh, liaise very closely with the hematologists. Thank you. This is another note for my wrap up because uh, your point is very valid. It's not the number of platelets, but how platelets mm -hmm. work. And the hematologists can give uh, a lot of good information in that respect. Chris, I want to uh, go back to your case because this was, uh, as you uh, titled, uh, a minor bleeding. But if you have this kind of drug reaction and the bleeding is major, so how to handle life-threatening uh, bleeding in general, but in this uh, case as well? Well, uh, let's say if you have a, a, a major TTP, just uh, shortly, because this is not a topic today, um, it really goes far. The patient has to go on intensive care. He uh, gets plasma separation. And then, and then you do what you have to do to stop bleeding. I mean, uh, you have to, um, to add um, um, a correlation components. You have to give uh, platelets. And you have to substitute the patient in order to stop the bleeding. This is the first thing. But for sure, you have to then stop all the medication that you have. So in this case, you have to stop aspirin as well, despite it doesn't help in the first days. This we also know. So you have to give platelets and, and really try to reestablish the uh, coagulation um, situation in this patient. Okay, I would like to uh, ask for your uh, brief opinion on uh, on this point that was raised in the chat, so probably it's time to discuss that. There are essentially three strategies to reduce bleeding in patients who are high bleeding risk. One is uh, shortening the APT by uh, removing the P2I12 inhibitor. The other one is removing aspirin. The third one is to de-escalate, so from prasugal or ticagrel to clopidogrel, and this is suggested by one of our colleagues uh, online. So um, what is your strategy to reduce bleeding? Uh, the one, the two, or the three? Let's start with the Roisin, then Chris, and then uh, Atspar. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I think there's a role for, for all three strategies. My preference is, is generally to stop the P2Y12 inhibitor and continue aspirin. And I know this is a contentious issue and there are kind of two schools of thinking and, and there's certainly a, a big movement lately to stopping aspirin early and, and um, you know, and continuing the P2Y12 inhibitor with, with, uh, the, with the DOAC. Um, I guess for me, you know, a lot of this is based on trials where, um, where we where aspirin was stopped, for example, all the triple therapy versus dual therapy trials, where in the triple therapy group, um, aspirin was the, the antiplatelet agent that was stopped. Um, but for me, it was very difficult to tease out in these trials whether the lower risk of bleeding, the rates of bleeding in the dual therapy group were due to stopping aspirin or due to using DOAX rather than warfarin as the as the oral anticoagulant. So for me, um, I, I'm not convinced that, that stopping aspirin is the is the right uh, antiplatelet agent to stop. I, I don't think we have the data on that, but that's my opinion. Okay, clear. So Chris, what is your strategy? Well, um, uh, despite I fully understand what Royson said, my strategy is exactly the opposite. I rather <laughs> yeah. try, I rather try uh, to to get rid of the aspirin, um, and this comes from from the early trials that we had on the dual antiplatelet, where we very frequently saw that aspirin is a driver for the bleeding. So, but I I, I have to admit we have no good trials in, for these specific settings. Um, so we come down to believe uh, uh, at this moment, and for me, it would be the aspirin. So uh, as far as we have a draw, so one uh, said yeah. uh, you know, clopida, the other aspirin, what's your opinion? Yeah. I, I, I have to apologize to Roisin, I'm, I'm with Chris <laughs> here, so that um, I, I, I do think that with the advent of more potent P2Y12s, uh, and you have the global leaders, you have Twilight, which seem to hint that um, with a single more powerful P2Y12 that it is safe to stop the aspirin without having an impact on ischemic events. And I do think this is where we are going um, in terms of antiplatelet. 
Um, I think the gastric irritation associated with aspirin, in spite of uh, non-steroidals, I think means that this is the first uh, uh, agent that I have now started dropping. And I feel very comfortable uh, stopping the aspirin, uh, provided I have a P2Y12 uh, on board. Okay, so the, the good news is that we have a draw again because I vote the same than Rosie. <laughs> <laughs> and, and actually, yes, just because of, of clinical inertia, because the arguments uh, uh, for dropping aspirin are very strong, I agree, as far. It would be nice to see really a comparison of monotherapies after three months now, which is the missing yeah. trial in this, uh, in this field. Uh, so uh, maybe one short question before uh, moving, uh, because we didn't mention stents. So we just spoke about the strategies, devices, no? So the question is easy, and uh, it's uh, in patients at high bleeding risk, are all stents equal for you, or you believe that you have to go with data and trials that uh, compare one stent for specific uh, indications? So let's start with the uh, ATSFAR this time. Yeah, so I'm slightly biased on this because I was part of the Resolute Onyx uh, 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 trial uh, and the committee. My feeling is that the third, if you want to call them third generation stents, are, are safe to use. Okay, so I would uh, say the um, BioFreedom stent, Synergy, Resolute Onyx, and Zients now have reasonable data. The two stents that have strong randomized control data are the Resolute Onyx and the BioFreedom. So I, th I don't think all stents are necessarily the same, but I would say that there are four stents with good supportive evidence to give both clinicians and patients confidence that if you implant these in high bleeding risk patients, then it may be safe to have a strategy of one month of dual antiplatelet therapy followed by single therapy. Okay, so let's go to uh, Chris now, so the other way around. Yeah, I'm, I'm more or less with Asfar, um, uh, and I believe uh, that everything you said is totally right. These third generation stands are all definitely better than the first generation that we had. That is the simple point. But now are all stents the same? And there I'm totally with you. We have some stents which have really, really good data. And uh, the main thing that I believe is that we should ask the companies to provide data for their stents. And we should ask all of them because this will uh, help us to safely uh, implant uh, in high bleeding risk patients. Thank you. Rosin? And I think this is something I could talk about all day, but I see time is, is running out. Um, I certainly, yeah, my, my preference would be to use, um, as, as, as we're called them, third generation drug eluting stents. Um, certainly we have good randomized data from Onyx 1 for, for the Resolute Onyx stent. For me, the BioFreedom stent, I'm not quite as in favor of using in that it's quite a thick strut stent. It's 120 microns thick compared with, you know, 60 to 90 microns for, for um, the newer generation uh, drug eluting stents. Um, and I think in, in the non-high bleeding risk um, scenarios, so sort out nine, we saw that it wasn't as efficacious um, as the Orzero stent um, in terms of target lesion revascularization, that the rate was nearly threefold higher with the, with the BioFreedom stent. So for me, I suppose I, I feel the efficacy of this stent isn't, isn't quite as uh, good as the, the really newer generation thin strut models, but there is a, a new iteration of the stent coming out. So perhaps this will um, will be will show more favorable data. Okay, so the, the three answers uh, give me the feeling that we have to go with the data. Now, fortunately, we have uh, good evidence uh, supporting not just one, but uh, multiple stents. So we can also choose based on uh, technicalities, procedural points, as uh, Roisin has uh, pointed out. So uh, I would go to the final uh, chapter of this uh, webinar, if you agree, and show you uh, some considerations on the other uh, uh, important uh, problem that we have in dealing with the HPR patients, which is uh, ischemia, essentially. So the risk of uh, thrombosis and the risk of myocardial infarction. We have seen that uh, when uh, a patient has a HPR frequently, there are also risk factors for thrombosis uh, and uh, uh, myocardial infarction. Um, of course, uh, common predictors, as we said, uh, and uh, you know, we have uh, several scoring systems 
that uh, give you the risk of thrombosis uh, as well as the risk of bleeding. So you can really balance uh, uh, the bleeding versus thrombotic events at different time points. The problem is that these scores are best applied uh, to the low to moderate risk populations uh, from which they were derived. So we have to acknowledge uh, uh, that problem of external validity in a way. So recently, there was uh, another effort from the ARC HPR group, uh, which was to derive this uh, trade-off model. And uh, to derive this uh, model, uh, they used uh, patient level data from five randomized trials and one observational registry. So you see here many of the studies that we have mentioned, latest three, uh, one and two, senior, CEOS, uh, Century 2, and uh, Paris. And then there was validation in the ONIX-1 uh, cohort. So you see here the list of predictors for bleeding on the left and the risk of predictors for uh, myocardial infarction and stent thrombosis. As some of these predictors are common to both situations and others are exclusive to one or another uh, situation. And uh, what uh, can, can we do with this kind of uh, information? Well, um, of course, uh, this uh, looks complex. Uh, it is, but po uh, the point that we want to make is that uh, uh, your patient is... Uh, one of these dots, essentially. There are patients who are at high risk of uh, having an MI or a stent thrombosis, like uh, patient one. And there are patients uh, who have a higher risk of having a back three to five bleeding as compared with the risk of having a myocardial infarction or stent thrombosis. So depending on where you are, you may end up with different actions, shortening the APT, de-escalate, et cetera, if the risk of bleeding is high, or maybe intensifying the antithrombotic therapy rather than uh, shortening because the risk of thrombosis is higher than the risk of bleeding. So it's useful to have something that uh, tell you and inform you of where the patient is in, in terms of balance between the two uh, risks. And then, of course, this is not a substitute for clinical judgment, but may inform and uh, in a way standardize your decision uh, making. Uh, it was complex, yes. So I'm happy that there is a smartphone app that uh, can be downloaded by the major app stores in order to uh, easily uh, get your result uh, by including a few uh, information. Okay, so this was my last slide, and if we can uh, uh, go back uh, live, uh, the four of us, uh, probably it's time for uh, final uh, uh, messages, uh, and I would like a key message from uh, all of you, from each of you, uh, what uh, our uh, uh, friends uh, at home uh, watching this webin webinar have to retain after this discussion. So one message from uh, uh, Asfar, I, I would say, Chris, and then the final word, of course, to, to Roisin. Asfar. So the final message is that there are now tools that allow us to better quantify the risk of ischemia and bleeding risk for every patient that we see. And we now have not just the tools to identify these patients, but also the uh, tools to treat patients appropriately with the appropriate stents and the appropriate medication. Thank you. Chris. Yeah, my message would be, this is a very individual decision making. Um, so it really requires the full full doctor to do so. Uh, and we uh, need to closely look at our patients when we make this, this decision. Thank you, Chris. Rosin. Um, thanks, Davide. So yeah, I think it's, it's really important to remember the bleeding versus thrombosis trade-off in patients. So many of our recent trials have used a bleeding primary endpoint, and, and it's really important not to forget about ischemia or thrombosis. Um, and I think in this respect, the, the uh, trade-off score that you nicely demonstrated, Davide, is going to be a, ch uh, a game changer for these patients to help individualize therapy. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much to all of you also for uh, uh, crystallizing these messages for uh, our friends who participated very actively. So we have seen a lot of questions in uh, in the app. We uh, try to reply to uh, most of uh, them. And of course, we uh, really thank them for uh, the great uh, discussion. But uh, of course, I want to uh, thank personally as far as uh, Zaman, uh, Christopher Naber, Roisin Kolleran for uh, participating in this webinar. And I want to thank uh, all the colleagues who watched it uh, and uh, I hope they enjoyed uh, this uh, message. There is another uh, webinar upcoming uh, on the topic of HBR with a different spin. So we hope that uh, this will be complementary and set the stage for a further discussion on this important and emerging topic. Thank you very much. Thank you all for your participation. Thanks, David. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.